I'm very pleased that my guest is Mr. Julius Novick, or, well, I guess his friends call him Jay, and I hope I, I count myself among them. Jay's been a theater critic for quite a few years at this point, and a very learned and very good teaching kind of theater person, and I'm, I'm sure he'll tell us about that, too. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Jay, how you doing? Good, Dad. How are you? Good, good. Now, do you prefer Jay or Julius or... Um... Uh, Jay in spoken language, Julius in written language, and we're talking. Okay, so, hello, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And how many years has it been since you really started writing seriously about theater? Um, something like 45. Oh, my. How old? No offense, but how old are you? Um, 66. You know, if I if you saw this man on the street, you'd think he was early 50s. That's a, that, that's for sure. Um, well, Mazel Tov. Like, where was your first outlet for your reviews? Well, I started with the college paper, and um, one summer I um, walked into the Village Voice offices, um, which were then on a little loft on Greenwich Avenue, and asked them for a job. And they said, we have no job because we have no money, but if you want to write for free, uh, let's see some of your clips. So I gave them some of my clips from uh, the college paper, and uh, i that was about, oh, 58, 59. I've been writing theater criticism in various places ever since. Were you involved in the development of the uh, the OB Awards, the Village Voice Awards? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was a, an OB judge for about 15 years. Gosh. And I assume since you started in that late 50s era, the big thing for you would have been discovering off Broadway, or or even off off at that point, or was that not a glimmer yet? Off Broadway, certainly. Um, off off, just beginning, but um, hitting with full force in the uh, in the sixties. But uh, at that time, I was um, particularly interested in uh, resident theater and theater outside New York, um, about which I uh, went so far as to write a book called Beyond Broadway. Uh -huh. And so you covered the, the nascent regional theater movement? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, back then, were the up-and-coming regional theaters? Um, well, mostly the ones bankrolled by the Ford Foundation, uh, the uh, Arena Stage in Washington, mm. uh, the uh, Actors Workshop in San Francisco, which didn't survive, the Guthrie in oh. Minneapolis, which I don't think was a Ford Foundation uh, grantee, and after... I think 64, um, the Alley Theater in, in Houston. Um, Which was your favorite? Did you have a, like a pet theater that you kind of was like, oh my God, this is as good as what's going on in New York? Um, well, things that were as good as what's going on in New York um, popped up unpredictably all over the place, really. I hmm. I wouldn't want to have um, picked a favorite, I suppose. Well, I guess the, the most significant at that time was... Uh, Arena Stage in Washington, which sent its production just around the end of the 60s, sent its production of uh, The Great White Hope to New York, where it was a huge hit on Broadway, because, uh, I think largely because... Um, James Earl Jones? Yeah, yeah, well, people were willing to, um, to pay money to see a uh, black man kiss a white woman on stage. I think that's why it ran two years, mm. although... Uh, I think I took it very. I can still take it very seriously as a, uh, as uh, one of the few American tragedies. But it was important in the the history of the American theater because it was the the first time that a a new play went from regional theater to real success in New York. Uh, the, until then, the regional theater um, premiere mm -hmm. tended to indicate a play that couldn't get to New York, but um, The Great White Hope reversed that, and now subsidized theater, both in New York and uh, out around the country, sustains oh, yeah. serious theater in Broadway. Almost so nothing as opens does. cold on Broadway anymore, mm -hmm. certainly not a play, I mean, you know, and if it has, it's usually been a disaster because it hasn't been developed mm -hmm. enough. Precisely. Um, so, so what happened? You were only with The Voice for about 15 years, or and, and where did you go after that? Um, I wrote to the voice, for The Voice until sometime around 1990, and then I was the 
first theater critic at the New York Observer. After that, I wrote um, for Newsday uh, for a little while, and mm -hmm. uh, when they were starting a New York paper, and um, then they fired me, and shortly after, New York Newsday closed down. Right. Um, well, now Newsday, you're getting your revenge because Newsday is firing people left and right now. They're they're just in terrible difficulty. Yeah. Uh, Currently, right for backstage, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me pull this away for a minute to um, a lecture, not, not a lecture actually, but a speech that you gave for the American Theater Critics Association, mm -hmm. of which I'm a member, a proud member, and um, that's basically a concatenation of theater critics from around the country who get together twice a year to talk about the theater in their towns and share experiences and problems of, of being journalists and what it means to be a critic. And if I may, I want to read uh, just a paragraph from the speech that you gave there, and, and maybe we can go from there if you don't mind. Uh, you said that critics, the best critics anyway, are above all writers, by which I mean not that they were indifferent to their possibilities as theatrical citizens and the responsibilities to their communities, but that they invested themselves deeply in the specific words they wrote. Ideally, our primary obligation is to our ideal reader, to our best selves, to write reviews that we would admire and envy if somebody else wrote them. In the real world, of course, this has to be tempered with consideration of our actual readers. The nearer our actual readers are to being this ideal reader, the more fulfilling our jobs will be and probably the less will be paid. But our obligation and our joy as writers is to convey what we have seen and heard and thought and felt at the theater as truthfully and vividly, as gracefully and clearly, and with as deep an understanding as we can and possible to refract the truth about the show we've just seen through our individual selves to a larger truth about the theater and a still larger truth about the world, unquote. Any comment on that? <laughs> well, but, but here, Quite a mouthful, huh? It is, but it is really well written. But here you are. Now, I have written for Backstage in the past. And, uh, I mean, I know the editor. She's a, a wonderful person. And I know the limitations there. Um, you know, I think, what, is it, what do you get, like three or four hundred words? Um, three, about three hundred. Three hundred words. And it's very name-oriented because of the kind of paper that it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to mention as many actors as you can and, and how they get you've got to do like you have to do I think the designer paragraph mm -hmm. which which we all dread it's like well the set was this and the lighting was this and the costumes was that boom mm -hmm. so you're, you're how do you reconcile the kind of things that you you idealize in your speech and having to write 300 words and twist it into this mold that, that broke me I, I couldn't write for backstage more than like you know a few months well um uh, you're onto something aren't you um oh dear <laughs> Uh, to pick up an old analogy, um, in this case, at the moment, I am like the signpost by the side of the road but uh, that points the way but does not necessarily go thither itself. The kind of writing that I do for backstage provides a context in which it's very difficult to practice the, the kind of criticism that I deeply believe in. Were you ever able to? I mean, let's not let's not demonize backstage. I mean, they have a certain audience and a certain amount of space, but were you even able to... I guess you were at The Voice, but even Newsday... Oh, day, oh the, the Voice, uh, in retrospect, uh, uh, at that time was paradise in terms of space. Right. I, I once wrote a review where I didn't mention the play until the eighth paragraph. <laughs> okay. Returning, returning to backstage, I tried to, what shall we say, sneak in as much real criticism as possible while still fulfilling my responsibilities to backstage, mm -hmm. which is a challenge. It's an interesting technical feat, kind of puzzle, to see how much you can get into 300 words. But I have to confess, it's not the kind of criticism that I believe in most deeply. Uh, but um, there's no law against writing that in other contexts. I'm, oh, sure. I'm working on a book oh, that I well, hope will, uh, will be the kind of criticism I'm talking about. And can you talk a little bit about what your book is about? Or, or I'm so glad you asked. Oh, good. Oh, um, okay. I mean, you never uh, ask a playwright because they won't say, hmm. you know, until it's done. But a, a, a book writer is like, oh, yeah, tell, I'll tell you everything. Oh, you bet. You bet. Well, uh, 
don't hold your breath for it because the uh, the manuscript isn't even due in, at the publishers until August of 2006. Mm. But it's a book about how the experience of being Jewish in America has been dramatized by Jewish American playwrights. Nice. There is quite a literature of evocations of Jewish life dating back almost to the beginning of the 20th century. A lot has been written about Jewish playwrights. Yeah. Neil Simon, uh, the the late Arthur Miller, above all. But well, Neil Simon was more overtly Jewish in most of his writing. Or you got Wendy Wasserstein now, and um, um, yeah, mm -hmm. you learn something about Miller by thinking about him as a Jewish playwright. Hmm. And similarly, among the other names that we've just mentioned, and put together, they provide a a kind of mirror of Jewish life as it evolves through the century. I think that's borne out by almost every show on Broadway right now. It alludes to, in some way, or is specifically Jewish. Everything from, from obviously, Revival of Fiddler on the Roof, to uh, Brooklyn Boy, which opened earlier this season, to you know, an entire production number in Monty Python's Spamalot, mm -hmm. given to the fact that you can't really have a Broadway show if you haven't any Jews. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so there's a certain cultural acknowledgement of, of our contribution. Speaking of both theater critics and Jews, I, I might as well slip this in there as well. Uh, this week you probably have heard about what happened at New York Magazine, I assume. Uh, no, no. Haven't news to me. Tell me about it. Oh, uh, Tell your listeners about it. It's pretty well no. I, or I thought it was that. Um, well, I live in a tree. What can <laughs> I tell you? <laughs> they got a new theater critic, a new chief theater critic at New York Magazine. They got the guy from the New York Sun, uh, McCracken, I think his mm -hmm. name is, uh, taking the place of John Simon. What happened to John Simon? He was fired. Really? For, not for any particular... After all that time. After 40-odd years, he's 79 years old. Mm -hmm. He thought it was... Um, he thought they were calling him in because his birthday was in a few days, and they gave him, like, a, a cupcake with candles on it or something. Mm -hmm. And instead it was like, well, no, it's, you know, time for you to go. Mm -hmm. what, well, your thoughts on... Well, they've, they've had changes at the top at uh, New York Magazine, yes. and it's a, it's a well-known fact of... Uh, journalistic life, and not only journalistic life, that um, when there's a new boss, he likes, or she, likes to bring in his or her own people. Well, do you have um, any particular thoughts, positive or negative, about the legacy of uh, John Simon? You didn't seem terribly keen on him uh, when that was brought up at the Theater Critics Convention that I mentioned. In view of the context that you just informed me about... Mm. I don't want to say very much about John Simon. It can be this positive. Point. He's yeah. been, uh, he's a man of great, great learning and intelligence, and he has been, uh, friendly and pleasant to me. And that, that's, um, well, I mean, that's why? where I'll leave that one. What, at this why point. censor? I mean, uh, you've said lovely things about him. What about his writing, which is certainly not something you need to censor yourself about, would you have had trouble with? Um, this week, I'll censor myself. Any other week, uh, I would have things to say, but, uh, okay, you, you, in, you in feel view like of what you've told me about yeah, what's okay. happened to him, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the time for, um, hmm. to say some things that I might otherwise been, been very happy to say. Okay, fair enough. Well, since we're, we're talking about timing, let's talk Tony's, because this is Tony time. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the awards are happening on Sunday, June 5th, broadcast on uh, CBS TV from 8 to 11 live. And uh, I think I'll be watching. I usually am. I, last year, in fact, there was a Tony party with, with a whole bunch of theater critics. And that, that really is the way to watch the Tonys, with a bunch of other critics who are just sitting there either screaming or just with their heads in their hands or jumping up and down, yelling, just like any real theater fan. Mm -hmm. which, which, actually, I would love if you made that clear, because I, I like to every now and again, that theater critics are fans. We, even someone like a John Simon, even someone like a Michael Riedel, who's, well, not a critic, but we... We don't hate the theater. We wouldn't be doing this if we hated it. Can you give a little, like, a pep talkish thing? Um, yeah, I think I think that's true. Even the the um, the most severe and um, angry and negative critics may be 
maybe they love it the most who love it most critically. One way of expressing love for a certain temperament is to make high demands and insist that the loved object live up to them. Analogously, the people who oppose American foreign policy are not necessarily the people who hate America. Uh, it's because they love it exactly. that they are so agonized and angry when it's unworthy of itself. But what do you say to people who say that if you raise a child just with ridiculously or, or loftily high expectations and then swat the child down every time they don't come up to that level, you're actually squelching the child and you're going to make a very middle-of-the-road kind of scared child. Well, the answer to that is that neither the theater nor the United States is a child. Well, on, on the world uh, stage, actually, the United States probably is a child, you know, with, with the new Russian Republic's an embryo or, or something like that. You, you could laugh at my jokes once. <laughs> anyway, um... <laughs> I'll take it under advisement. Thank you, thank you. All right, let, let's get to... Um, do you have the list of the Tony nominees in I've front? Got it, I've got it in front of me. Okay, um, then let's run it down from, from the top. Well, before we yeah, do that, sure. um, I, I have, as you know, mixed feelings about the Tonys, about awards in general. They're, oh, please, yeah. They're not criticism. They're hype. How do you decide that Glenn Gary Glenn Ross is a better revival than Twelve Angry Men, or vice versa. Uh, well, as someone in Shakespeare says, comparisons are odorous. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are sometimes. There's no reliable playometer by <laughs> which one show gets a higher score of merit than another. Granted that, the temptation to play the Tony game is irresistible. True. And as you were saying before, critics are no more resistant to it than any... And if you're theater fans or the producers or the managers, and, and also yeah. even as writers, you can't necessarily get away from, let's say, in this particular season, saying, okay, we've had play revivals of Night Mother, Steel Magnolias, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, and On Golden Pond, all kind of almost from the same era and of the same cloth, in a way, for the most part, of playwriting. Mm -hmm. So there is going to be, in some level, even in the discussion of it or the writing of it, saying, well, this, you know, this is the one that clicked, and Night Mother just kind of did not. And there, there are comparisons. You can't not when you Yeah, when well, you some, some, things, some things are clearly uh, better than other things, or at least uh, seem so very clearly to the observer. But how do you distinguish between the best and the next best? Uh, I think in most cases that's a very artificial distinction, mm. which doesn't necessarily stop me from making it. Do you vote? So I vote uh, for the Drama Desk Awards. Cool, okay. Like most people, I like to spread my opinion around and um, see my favorite triumph. But, um, and in fact, even as uh, we were talking before about the Obies, which you were there in yeah. the early process mm -hmm. of, so that still... Yeah, well, the Obies were, were, and I believe are, run on a different basis. There's not a question of, of competition and of picking the best but rather to give awards wherever awards are deserved. But at the same time, as a game, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to resist playing it. And you want to, to do whatever you can to give honor and delight and a career boost to people who have given you joy and delight. I think it's uh, ultimately positive because the theater needs all the attention, all the publicity it can get. And this is a, um, a valuable chance to remind America, which on the whole isn't much interested, hmm. that theater does exist and might offer something of value. Best play, Michael Frayn's Democracy, John Patrick Shanley's Doubt, August Wilson's Gem of the Ocean, and Martin McDonough's Pillow Man. Well, my vote there goes... Those, I, I just saw The Pillow Man last night, mm -hmm. and uh, I admired its cleverness, but I don't think it's about very much. And Wow, we totally agree. Okay. Doubt is equally finely crafted, not quite as individual and original, but much, much more substantial. It's about something. It, 
Well, that was my... It opens yeah. the same kind of window onto something larger than itself that in a, in a small way I think a review can do. When I first saw Doubt, I liked it. I mean, I don't think anybody doesn't like Doubt, but I found it a little bit small. I found the way, you know, theater, because budgets have shrunk as far as paying actors. It would have been nice to have been an eight or nine character show and have a larger scope to it. There was something a little bit chambery. Took away just a bit. Whereas with Pillow Man, while I was watching it, I was very captivated, very thrilled, and thought it was going to be, as you said, about something. I thought it would be a political, certainly personal, but also because it takes place in a totalitarian state. And these are corrupt and brutal policemen. I thought there would be something more there about that. And it turned out to be just Martin McDonough's people being nasty to each other. They always are. And, and that's why, ultimately, I would give my, uh, my not to doubt as well. Any, any thoughts on Jim of the Ocean or Democracy, though? I admire Democracy very much, but uh, it just didn't compel me as much as, yeah. uh, as, much as doubt did. Let's do the uh, four best musical nominations, which, moving up, so I won't, I'll do them reverse alphabetically, because why not? Uh, the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, which is by uh, William Finn, Monty Python's Spamalot by Eric Idle and John Duprez, The Light in the Piazza, the Adam Gettle Show, and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, with uh, the score by David Yazbek. Your thoughts? There's really no comparison that, uh, for me, the... Uh the Light in the Piazza oh, is the most no. significant thing that happened to the musical theater this year. Why? You're going to say it's about real people? That's usually the line that... The, the um, well, yeah, I'll go for that, among other things. And um, I hate to use terms like taste, but it's there was a high consistency in everything about that show. And it, it caught something that's very difficult to catch. It caught innocence without sentimentality, without cliché. Not only emotional appeal, it, for me it had, uh, i got to say, erotic appeal as well. Oh. Okay. Without being in any way crass about it. There was an individuality to it, a faithfulness to its own vision, a refusal to compromise and just do showbiz that I admire tremendously. And did you like the score? No. I don't think anybody went home whistling it, but uh, I would like to hear it again. It supported the emotions. It amplified the emotions. It brought you into the feelings of those characters. The Light in the Piazza is, is one of the very few things I've seen this year for which the word beautiful comes to mind. Hmm. Okay, I, I had a couple of other... I hear the sounds of somebody not being convinced. Yeah, I was too busy yawning tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, no, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't sleeping, but I wasn't particularly captivated, and I would have been had I liked the score. Had I had Lerner and Lowe doing the music, I think I would have dug it. Mm -hmm. Um... Had he had William Finn doing a better score than he did for 25th uh, Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, I probably would have done it. But Gettle just doesn't get me. He, he writes stuff that seems to sound like a song that's attractive and just doesn't happen somewhere. And it's aria-like, but I'm not into that. You know, I, mean, I think, um, speaking of John Simon before, he said it has elements of Schoenberg in it, in which, you know, that's one of his favorite composers. And I'm like, okay, you know, great for you. It's not necessarily what I want to hear when I go to a Broadway, even a serious quote-unquote Broadway show. What matters with a work of art is the, trans is the transaction, particularly in the theater, between the work of art and each individual viewer, spectator, audience member. Everybody comes to the theater with an at least slightly different set of receptors, mm -hmm. preferences, abilities to comprehend, experiences that dovetail or connect in various ways, conscious and unconscious, with what's going on on stage, mm -hmm. um, even um, erotic susceptibilities, uh, because um, there's a lot of sex in the theater. And they're... Um, and thank God for that. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> um, 
opposite views can be equally legitimate, even when one one of the views in question is opposite to mine. Well, well, yes, and that is what it's all about. Right? Something that I sometimes have great difficulty conceding, but I well, do believe. You've defined what good criticism or what critics should try to do, but how do you how should a person pick or or know which critic to trust? Uh, it's the friend whose tastes are similar to yours, uh, whom you are going to listen to next time out. So who are the um, critics that, that most influenced you in your beginnings, and, and even over the more recent years, come to think of it? During the more recent years, I haven't been um, a whole lot influenced by uh, by anybody. When I was starting out, well, my ultimate hero, as as you probably know, is George Bernard Shaw, mm. who made connections between the theater and life outside the theater with a depth and a, and a brilliance that nobody has since matched. My more immediate heroes, Eric Bentley, who was uh, essentially leading a campaign against Broadway, <laughs> and Walter Kerr, ah. who was leading a campaign on behalf of Broadway. To, well, it, no, in Kerr's case, it wasn't a campaign because he didn't have a sense of it being... Uh, attacked, Broadway was the center of the theater universe, whereas for Bentley, Broadway was more like the Dark Tower of Mordor. <laughs> uh, and what's it for you, by the way? Pardon me? And what is it for you? Is it somewhere um, halfway between Mordor or Murder? Um, and then the, the I Golden think Tower? at this point, closer to, uh, to Walter Kerr's ability, willingness to except Broadway. Um, oh, that's interesting. So as you've gotten further you know, along, you, you've become more, um, what's the uh, well, accepting. I uh, thought it might be the other way yeah. around. Uh, what can I tell you? I've become a mellow old fart. And, uh, uh, can I quote you on that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, no, but, but, but I'm, a, I'm yeah. a, lo- a lot less immediately rebellious Broadway is on the whole, not young people's territory, except except as far there. as the provision of eye candy is concerned. Right. Well, no, and also stuff like Brooklyn and uh, and Rent, which which have tried to make little chinks in the armor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but then, and, but then and you Broadway, see them in Broadway the Broadway was able to accommodate Brooklyn. I have no um, <laughs> I have no wish to defend. Oh, uh, uh, you know, but I, uh, Rent I admire a great deal, and uh, the fact that Broadway was open to that uh, is significant. Over the 40-odd years that you've been doing what you've been doing, any priceless memories? Andre Chabon and uh, Elizabeth Cueto's um, fragments of a trilogy, three productions of Greek tragedy that... Uh, it was at La Mama, right? Or that was at La Mama, mm-hmm. yeah, and in the 70s, early 70s, and that fulfilled an ideal of mine by combining avant-garde techniques with ancient material, embracing tradition and renewing it rather than rejecting it. Um, Another memory that floats to the top immediately was uh, a production of the National Theatre of Great Britain of medieval mystery plays. Come to think of it somewhat like uh, at least part of uh, the Sherban Suedos trilogy in an environmental staging where the actors and the audience shared the same space. And I will never forget walking, mm-hmm. following Jesus as he was carrying the cross. And I was weeping. And I'm not even a Christian! <laughs> Yeah, we established that early on. Yeah, yeah oh, we did, oh, we did. okay, yeah, right, yeah, so we did, so we did. Uh, oh, okay, so interesting. And finding the intense human drama in that story, and then revival after revival of, I, I never saw Lee J. Cobb in Death of the Salesman, oh. but I did see Dustin Hoffman and George C. Scott and Brian Dennehy each time. I was devastated. 
you came out feeling differently from the way you, the yeah. way you came Once in. Once I stopped crying, yeah, exactly. Um, well, I'm certainly not crying over having Jay Novick as my guest in the neighborhood. God, what a terrible segue that was, but you know... <laughs> I don't know it was so bad. Uh, I thought it was rather ingenious. I have such. Oh, thank you. All right, I take it back. It was a wonderful, segment, yeah, a great well, conversation. Well, maybe I just don't listen to enough radio. No, you don't. You <laughs> should, <laughs> Mr. J. Novick. I want to thank him so much for talking theater. The pleasure was mine.